I'd like to most of math or science? Computer science. Okay. Math. Uh, I was thinking I said okay, I was I was thinking I was gonna to get to talk mostly about math, but well I'll talk about math. Okay. Well so I want to talk a bit about some uh, I'll talk some about technology that we've been developing and kind of an arc of uh, technology that we've been pursuing for, I've been pursuing for about 35 years now. Um, it happens to be in a particularly interesting state right now um, because it's all sort of coming together uh, mostly around this, this working language system. Maybe I should talk a little bit about, uh, let, let, me, let me talk about some of the, boy, this is a very low resolution. Okay, so uh, let me, um, uh, what I'd like to do is talk a bit about the Wolfram language, what it is, uh, what's possible with it. I will talk a bit about kind of uh, thinking about uh, sort of the uh, doing math with computers and the future of doing math with computers. So I, I assume many of you have used Wolfram Alpha. Who here has used Wolfram Alpha? Okay. So, <laughs> Um, and uh, so people probably know roughly what Wolfram Alpha does. Kind of the, the concept of Wolfram Alpha is, right here, um, that uh, uh, you give it a, So, so the idea of Wolfram Alpha is uh, it's supposed to know a lot about how to compute things and about the world, and you're supposed to be able to talk to it in as natural a way as, as uh, uh, in, in the way that you would naturally do it using natural language, and it's supposed to be able to give you kind of a report of the answer to your question. So if you say, you know, what is the integral of, you know, x cubed uh, sine squared x or something? Uh, it should be able to understand that question and then give you the answer. And it, it's going to generate the kind of report that tells you about things it thinks you might find interesting, given that that was the question you asked. So it'll make some plots, it'll show you some alternative forms of the integral, it might show you some things, okay, that's an alternate form, which, a simplification which is only true if x is greater than zero. Um, there's some things about some definite integrals here from zero to two pi and so on that thought you might find interesting. Um, its goal is to kind of tell you, based on the question you asked, to compute an answer and to compute things that it thinks you might find interesting. You can go ahead if you want to, if you are, uh, this is a, has become a pretty popular feature, you can go and say, show me the steps for doing this computation. Um, this is, you know, these steps are in a sense completely fake. They have absolutely nothing to do with the way that the underlying engine computed the answer to the center goal. They're steps intended purely for human consumption. Um, the, it's sort of interesting, you know, if you, you wonder how does it actually compute something like an integral. Um, the answer is it uses kind of an industrial machine for computing integrals that has almost nothing to do with the way that people are taught to compute integrals by hand. So, so for example, one of, the, one of the big facts about integrals is that almost any integral that shows up, uh, the integrand can be expressed as some kind of product of generalized type of geometric functions, special cases of which are the sines and cosines and logs and all that kind of thing. And then there's just a formula for what the integral of some product of you know, two or three hypergeometric <coughs> functions is, and the formula gives an answer in terms of some big, very hairy hypergeometric function. So you know, we could just wimp out and say, the answer to this integral is this big, hairy hypergeometric function. Most people would say that's a stupid answer, not very useful. Um, so the real work tends to be to figure out, given this complicated, hairy hypergeometric function, um, what are the, the coincidental uh, uh, special cases that lead the answer to be expressible in terms of sines and cosines and vessel functions and things like that. It's actually a difficult math problem to do that reduction. It's, you know, you can embed in it all sorts of word problems for groups and all kinds of other things, and you can fairly easily see that the general problem of figuring out, you know, what is the simplest possible form is, is unsolvable, there's all kinds of undecidability involved. But in practice, for, you know, billions of integrals that get done every year with our systems, uh, in practice, undecidability probably does not rear its head in any terribly serious way, and most of the time, 
that thing that was, you know, that the industrial machine produced as some complicated hairy hypergeometric function can be reduced to something that humans will recognize as, oh yeah, that's the answer. And it might be the same answer that's in the back of the book, or it might be a different form than is in the back of the book, and so on. Anyway, these, these steps are something different because they're actually set up. They have nothing to do with the sort of industrial method for computing integrals. Instead, they're a series of moves that uh, are model the way that humans uh, are supposed to do integrals and can give you an answer. It really helps to know what the answer is at the end because you can work kind of both ways in terms of the steps. You can go from the integrand and you can do steps away from the answer and you can work backwards, probably like people do if they look at the answer in the back of the book and so on. Um, anyway, it's a, to me, it's a slightly bizarre moment in, in history where, where we, you know, the actual doing of an integral is comparatively easy at this point with the technology that we have. Coming up with the steps is a little bit harder. Um, if you really want to make things hard, you can um, generate problems to, let's see if I can find it, uh, if you have some result. Um, or we could say, uh, you know, how many students are Tufts versus uh, Brandeis or something. Um, and it should be able to, to answer that. And it, it knows about lots of different kinds of data about lots of different things. But you could go and say something like, um, uh, you could maybe type in some genome sequence here. Um, and uh, it will figure out that the thing I just typed in is a genome sequence. It will go and try and look it up on the human genome. OK, there we go. There's a match, a few, a few matches on the human genome. You can go and say, what's that gene there? Um, and uh, it will be able to tell us all kinds of things about that, hopefully. Well, we can do, um, uh, uh, let's try something completely different. Let's say um, uh, uh, aircraft overhead. So this is now using completely different kind of data. Um, OK, so this is going to tell us based on the feed from the FAA of, of flights that are flying. And, you know, the, the theory of, of all software like this is that you build this giant technology stack and you can kind of look out the window and see whether it's giving you the right answer. Um, uh, but you, know, you can pick one. Let's try this one. Uh, so so random, you know, um, and hopefully, uh, that's a, that's a telling us about that particular plane, it's telling us the, the, um, uh, the history of that plane, the, the altitude is much of time and so on. It's sort of remarkable how much stuff you can compute about the world um, once you kind of open up that possibility. So there are all kinds of different things we've spent the last, the International Space Station or something. What, uh, what you have to compute is given some feed of all the elements of the space station. The interesting thing to compute is where is the space station right now? And uh, uh, for example, when will it next be visible from, um, from where you are, um, those kinds of things. Um, so the typical thing is you've got a bunch of underlying data. Some of it is static data, like you know, uh, densities of elements. Some of it is um, uh, dynamic data, like uh, you know, what were the earthquakes that just happened, and, uh, or what uh, was the price of some stock, or something like this, or what was the position of some airplane. Um, you've got all of that data, you then have to implement all the sort of models and methods and algorithms and so on that come from science and engineering and, and other areas to actually be able to answer questions on the basis of that underlying data. Um, and then after you've done that, you have to figure out how do you actually communicate with, uh, with the system to ask it the questions you want to ask. And then you have to solve the problem of how do you understand the natural language that you feed in um, to, uh, uh, to ask those questions. And people have been Sort of working on natural language understanding for a really long time with, with not tremendously great success for a long time. Um, I think the main thing that made it much easier for us to be really pretty successful at doing natural language understanding was that we had a system that has a huge amount of knowledge in it. And when humans try to understand what each other are talking about, um, one is typically using quite a lot of knowledge of the actual meaning of the thing that's being said, not just this is a verb, this is a noun, this is a you know adjectival phrase, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you use a lot, of, a lot of underlying knowledge. And this was sort of the first time where one had a system that had a lot of real underlying knowledge combined with some perhaps slightly interesting, innovative ideas about how to do computational linguistics um, on a natural language stream. 
Um, and so, so that's sort of the third component is understand the natural language that's being given as, as input. Well, the, um, and then the, sort of the fourth thing is, okay, so given that you can compute all this stuff, what do people actually want to see as sort of the report of the output? And that's a whole separate set of heuristics and analytics and so on to do that. And so at this point, uh, you know, Wolfram Alpha gets used on the web uh, many tens of millions of times every day. It gets used inside things like Siri uh, many more times per day. Uh, the, and it gets used in lots of other places, lots of intelligent assistants and other kinds of things. Um, it also gets used in, in uh, custom versions of it get used in lots of corporations and, uh, uh, and large organizations of other kinds. But it's sort of a mixture of the public data that Wolfram Alpha knows that you can find it having on the web together with the internal data of some organization um, that has been uh, sort of uh, 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 put into the same framework. So, so anyway, that's that's the, the kind of the, the world of what's uh, It's interesting as we as we try and you know uh, as you add things to the language. I mean, the, the number one problem is how do you how do you design the functionality? And for me, it's been a fascinating thing because I've had to learn about all these different areas of, of human endeavor, so to speak. Because the basic meta point is, if you don't understand the area in some depth you will not be able to do a good functional design for a language in that area. And so there are all these, all these different kinds of areas, and the, and the goal is to have a fairly small number of principles um, and to follow those and to be able to apply those principles in all these different areas. So gradually, over time, we bring different kinds of areas online. So one recent one is uh, geometry. We finally now have uh, uh, well, well in hand. It took us many, many years to figure out sort of how to make geometry um, an area that can be brought within our domain. And once we have geometry, we have to support all kinds of things with respect to geometry. So for example, let's say I say, you know, let me get the disk at position zero, zero, with radius one. Okay, great, that's a disk. We can make a picture of it. We can also say, what's the area of that disk? And put it will be pi. Um, and we can say something like, if we have a region union of that disk together with a <coughs> disk at position, let's say, zero or half, and it has size two or something, then uh, we can ask what's the area of four pi grid. Um, that's because that is <coughs> so let's make this thing, um, let's make, put, put that at position y. So, okay, so now it's gonna have to do some, some doable thing. Oh, it uh, it's some, um, how hard is that computation? Uh, um, it's, it's got to do some integral or something to figure out the symbolic results here. I'll tell you what, let, let's do, let's keep it simple for the thing. Um, let's, uh, let's pull it off. And let's say, let's just check what happens if I just say psi 0.3 here, okay, great. So let's make a plot of that as a function of the y value here. Um, it was probably going to be so complicated to get here and here. Um, so let's go with minus 5, <coughs> 5 or something here. And this should be able to tell us. Okay, so that's now the, um, uh, the combined area of these two disks um, uh, as, as one disk moves relative to another. So you, know, you have to be able to do all of that kind of thing. Now we could also take this region union and I could start solving a, a numerical differential equation, solving some differential equation over that region, or I could do something like, well I could say, let, let me just generate a bunch of random points, for example. I could say, um, so let's say random real, let's say size 100, let's say one. 200 random points, each with three coordinates. Okay, there I have that, and then I could say something like make the Delaunay mesh that. So now I will have some some three dimensional solid made by taking a, a mesh that goes around those things. And for example, I could say get the volume of that mesh. There's the answer. Um, and now if I was if I could set it up properly, I could start saying um, what's the um, uh, you know, solve some differential equations for that. Actually, let me try something that's a little bit more elaborate here. So let's say I've got that mesh. Um, so let's say uh, something like region nearest, and then let's say here's the mesh um, of that mesh. And then I, let me just put a point at position 200, 300, uh, 400 or something. And this should tell me, okay, so that's telling me the nearest point on that mesh to the point that I just added. Okay. And so I could probably make, um, I don't know, let's, let's, uh, let's make a picture, let's make a coordinate, um, uh, let's just say that the y coordinate, 
let's say that you know, more than that, um, and that's uh, why the normal time is very interesting, but let's, let's do that anyway. And let's say make the plot of that as a function of y going from um, minus, minus 400 to 400. So that's showing that basically as, as you move that point around, um, the nearest approach <coughs> on that Dobonai mesh thing uh, will move from place to place. Anyway, so this is an example. Something like geometry is an example of, a, of an area where you know you have to kind of make uh, it, make geometry fit in with everything else that's being done in the system. Um, let me show you a couple of other things here, and then I want to talk about that. So, a little bit about math and kind of things. so another another sort of big big aspect of what we're doing here is being able to uh, deploy stuff to the cloud. You know, I used to think that the cloud was just this thing that uh, was sort of a utility uh, creature that um, didn't really have a, a kind of conceptual significance. But I, I kind of realized in more recent times that the cloud is actually a very interesting thing because it's, a, it's sort of a, a um, uh, uh, it's kind of a, a um, persistent repository of computation. And it's, it's kind of interesting what you can do with that persistent repository of computation. Well, this is the thing that um, uh, what I was doing inside uh, our language, um, um, so, so this is now interacting. This is just a web browser. And what's interesting about this is that I can do the same stuff just in a web browser that I was doing uh, on my desktop. But now what's happening is that the computations are happening in the cloud rather than locally on my computer. So I can go ahead and I, if I, for example, say make, you know, a manipulate here with that being a parameter, I can do this and I can say A goes from one to five or something. And now I can, um, and I'll get something where uh, on, on the desktop, it was something where there was a nice kind of smooth thing. Here, every time I move the slider, it's gonna have to go back to the cloud say, uh, you know, to, to redo the computation so it's a little bit slower. But what's interesting about that is I can take this thing and it's just a piece of, of web stuff and I can go and embed it on any website um, and I can, uh, can interact with it there. Um, okay, let's go back to, um, over to the desktop here and let's look at something else we can do. So we can take something like, um, uh, we can build a little app here. So, um, for example, let's imagine that we wanted to build a, uh, an internet-friendly cat app. Um, so, uh, um, Cats, of so course. Let's say, let's say, magnify it. Um, now, what I'm doing here is I'm specifying, make a form uh, that has a single field, which it says is called breed, and that's going to be a cat breed, and I'm going to say the result is the magnified version of the image of the cat breed. Okay? So what will happen here is... breed of cat, and this is doing natural language understanding. <laughs> um, I could, for example, add something here that um, uh, uh, uses a different parameter. Let's say I want the cat at an angle, and let's say I can say, you know, rotate the angle by the cat by uh, angle number of degrees. Um, okay, so now I will be deploying this little app again. Um, and now I'll have two branches here. And I'll say, you know, this is, I don't know, you can say a Siamese cat, for example, here, and let's say it's about 70 degrees. Um, and uh, what should happen is it will go back to the <laughs> and get the um, So, from, if you're interested in, in sort of practical you know, software engineering kinds of things, probably the most interesting thing you can do here is to turn this into an API function. And this will then become, this will then create. This is now kind of software engineering stuff, but that will create a RESTful API. Um, you didn't fill in any parameters to the RESTful API here, so, so I can't do anything. But if we go 
but we fill the parameters here, you know, room equals max, um, ampersand angle equals uh, 107 degrees or something. That will then call the um, uh, that will then call that code and get that result. So you can include that that API inside some other other program and call our cloud from the other program. You can also take that result and you can say, give me the code to embed that inside a, let's say, a Java program. Um, and so now we can get, there's the Java code, <coughs> which uh, you can call to go and send data to that, to our, to that thing in our cloud that will do that computation, okay? So this is all, um, so you can do all kinds of things like this. You can also, um, uh, there's, there's lots of ways that you can interact with the cloud. So another thing that's coming, actually, in the next couple of weeks, um, I can probably show you here, is a thing called uh, Data Drop. Um, and what that does is it's a thing where, basically, it's a way of sending data to our cloud from any kind of device. Um, and so it has a very simple way for devices, physical devices, to connect to the cloud uh, through various kinds of APIs. You can send an email, you can tweet to it, you can do all kinds of different things. But basically, the goal is to push data into our cloud. Once it's in our cloud, um, you then get basically a time series of results back, um, which you can then analyze um, using the language. And then if you want to, you can generate a report from that. You can potentially call the report for an API. There's a whole stack of stuff you can do. But what's interesting about the, the data drop is from any kind of device, um, you will be able to just push data into our cloud. And the thing that we're doing is we have this notion of data semantics. So when I had, um, you know, if I have something like this, um, I can say, okay, this is going to be a city. So let's say it's, um, you know, let's say it was Medford Mass here. Um, this, that interpreter thing says, the thing that follows, the, the, it, it specifies, um, a, you know, many different types of things. So for example, I could say, this was going to be a temperature or something. Let's say this was a date. Um, so then I could say something like, you know, August 11, uh, 1999. I could give that date in all kinds of different formats, and the thing will understand the semantics of that. And this is a way that, that when you have um, data that's coming in, and so for example, in the data drop, a given device has a certain data signature, and that data signature is used to uh, interpret the raw bits that are coming from the device and turn it into this is a geoposition, this is a time, this is a temperature, and so on. And that allows you to combine data from many different devices and so on. Um, it's, it's sort of a useful thing. Uh, we're also going to have a data repository that's intended for data-backed uh, publications and so on, where you can have the data uh, associated with something in a, in a semantic form like that. Well, let's see, the, the uh, math is, um, uh, um, and then, uh, uh, so one thing, you know, we're trying to collect data on lots of kinds of things. And so one of the areas that one might want to collect data on is math. Um, and we've done a, um, uh, you know, within Mathematica and so on, we've been sort of steadily grinding through implementing the math of the 18th century, 19th century, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have now, at this point, you know, I think we've pretty much nailed, you know, we pretty much got to the end of the, of the 19th century. You know, anything that was in, anything that was called math in the 19th century, you probably can just compute the answers. Um, the, uh, uh, now the question is, what happens when we uh, venture into um, century itself. And we've got also some, some very nice 20th century math as well, and all sorts of computation and all that. But one of the things that's been true about pure math is that, that, that there's a question of how does one use what we're doing to do pure math research, for example. And, you know, the question is what's the kind of workflow of pure math research? The workflow of most of the places where math is used is question goes in, crunching happens, answer is generated. That's the typical workflow of what people do when they use math. The typical workflow of doing pure math research is a little different. You know, you look at a pure math paper and it will start, you know, let, you know, let F be a field with these properties. In this paper, we will prove this and this and this thing, okay? 
So it's a little different. It's not saying, here's this thing to compute, crunch, 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 and nuts. So the question that I've been wondering about for years is, can one be useful in doing, uh, with, in doing computation to help the kind of math that became popular in the 20th century of this kind of pure math where you're basically just explicating kind of the, the um, uh, uh, something about a, a mathematical structure. So I got interested in how can we do that, and I realized at some point, gosh, we have a very good paradigm for how that works, and that paradigm is what happens in Wolfram Alpha. If you say something like, you know, Tufts Universe and Wolfram Alpha, there's nothing to compute, there's no answer. What Wolfram Alpha will do is it will try and tell you things it thinks you might find interesting about Tufts University. Right? And so that you can use that exact same pattern to think about pure math and say, imagine you have described a structure, a mathematical structure, with certain constraints. You say it's a field, you say it has these properties, etc., etc., etc. Then the mission of the system can be, well, tell me something interesting about a thing like that. Okay? So how do you do that? Well, there's a variety of things you might do. Um, one thing you might do is, let's say, uh, let's just try and prove theorems about that thing automatically. Okay? Well, we have pretty powerful automated theorem proving systems now. Um, they're not so good at doing, I mean, they're, they're good if you're at the level of sort of equational logic type things. You know, if you've got, um, if you're uh, right down in the weeds, kind of, um, you know, you're proving something about a Boolean expression, you're maybe, um, like, like, for example, I figured out a number of years ago, uh, let's see, where's a good example? Here we go. Oh, no, okay. Oh, here we go. Um, so this is, um, <coughs> this particular axiom, this thing here, um, turns out to be a, um, a complete axiom system for Boolean algebra. It is the simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra. Maybe it would make it look nicer if I say uh, this F. That axiom system turns out to be, this is just an interesting math fact, it is the simplest axiom system from which you can derive all of Boolean algebra. And uh, I found that about 15 years ago now, uh, by doing a search of all possible axiom systems, kind of just enumerating them, and using what made a clear improvement to figure out which axiom system uh, was the, you know, was, was equivalent to Boolean algebra, was not equivalent to Boolean algebra, um, that's the simplest thing it is. Okay. So it's very easy in our language now to, for example, prove commutativity from that. So for example, maybe just to prove this in the paper, let's try proving, let's see, what is, what is NAND? What is NAND to? But the, the, this dot essentially represents the NAND operator. Okay. Um, so NAND, if, well, what is NAND? I should, um, I should know this, but what's NAND? What happens if you do that? that um, uh, oh, I probably need to say, uh, should minimize that NAND expression. Ah, true, okay. So it should be the case that if I feed that in, uh, if I feed that, what, what is true NAND if that NAND is let's, um, let's just, uh, um, let's just enumerate possible theorems um, and say, uh, you know, and then, and then just decide that um, we're going to, um, the theorem, uh, uh, we can enumerate all possible theorems. So we have the set of constraints, we say, and we have an axiom system that this thing is based on. Let's just say, let's just start generating theorems from that axiom system. I mean, it makes it seem math seem a little bit, um, you know, a, a famous, it makes math seem a bit mechanical. It's kind of like the, the quote um, from um, uh, Poincaré, I think, um, uh, in discussion of Hilbert's program for, for sort of mechanizing mathematics. And he said, you know, if you, if you mechanize finding theorems of mathematics, he said it's like, this machine that he'd heard about in Chicago where pigs went in at one end and uh, uh, hamburgers came out at the other. <laughs> and that's kind of like uh, the process then for, for finding um, uh, math. But in any case, so one question that you might ask is, okay, you can generate all these theorems, but most of these theorems are probably completely uninteresting. Um, and so you can ask the question, can you tell which theorems are interesting? So given, given a collection of theorems, which is generating theorems, uh, you know, enumerating all possible theorems, which theorems are interesting. So I assumed there was no way to tell this, that that was a purely historical thing. It's just, you know, 
that was because Gauss found that it must be interesting to activate. But um, uh, a number of years ago, I thought, well, let's just test that hypothesis. So I took all the theorems of Boolean algebra, and you just put them in order according to from the one that has the smallest number of characters, smallest number of operators, and then you keep going as you know, more and more complicated theorems. And you say, well, which ones are interesting? So a good criterion for interesting is were they given names in uh, you know, what they call modus ponens, or law of excluded middle, or whatever else it is. Um, were they given names in logic textbooks? And there are 14 uh, theorems of Boolean algebra that are given names in typical logic textbooks, very consistent. Um, and so then you ask, well, where do those lie in the space of all possible uh, uh, theorems? And the answer is that there is actually a pattern to it. It turns out that if you look, look, write out these uh, theorems in sort of some kind of lexicographic order, then you go through and you look at a particular theorem and you say, can this theorem be proved from theorems <coughs> earlier in the list? That is, you assume that theorems earlier, in, you know that theorems earlier in the list are true. You don't know the axiom systems of Boolean algebra. You simply say, the theorems we've already written down are the things we know. Can we prove this new theorem from the ones we've already written down? Okay? So it turns out that with one minor exception, all of these theorems that are usually called interesting and that you know, are given names in other textbooks are precisely the ones that you cannot prove from things that precede them in the list. So in a sense, they're the minimal statements of new information about logic. So that's kind of interesting. So it gives you a criterion for which theorems are interesting. Now, you can imagine using that criterion, given a, an automated producer of theorems, to say which ones are interesting. And of course, to really make them interesting, they have to have a whole story about them. They have to have a whole mythology, and you know, they have to have all kinds of all kinds of structure built up around them. But I think gives one some gives one some hope that you might be able to identify. And you know, in general, you can imagine doing kind of empirical meta <coughs> So let's say you have the network of all theorems that are true in number theory or something and you know which theorem can be proved from which other theorem and so on, and you're seeing this whole network, and you ask, well, what can you tell about these theorems from this network? And like, for example, you might say, well, this is a, uh, this is a powerful theorem. Why? Because in this, in this graph of connectivity of, net of theorems, this theorem is the thing that connects this big blob of theorems over here to this big blob of theorems over here, maybe. Maybe you could say this is a surprising theorem because, well, this is a, I don't know, because it's something that's out on the corner somewhere. I think there's a whole world of sort of empirical metamathematics. I haven't done it. Um, I think there's a whole world of that kind of empirical metamathematics that one could do um, from um, uh, given this information. Now, I, I did do, actually, I looked for, um, um, I looked for at least the um, uh, uh, Euclid. You can look at, um, uh, it's a completely boring picture. Um, oops. Uh, the, that picture there um, is the completely boring um, network of the proof structure of Euclid. So it starts off on the left from the, the, um, the axioms, um, and then what it's showing is, as you go further to the right, it's showing the collection of theorems that you can prove by a certain number of steps from those initial axioms. And so you might ask, well, what's the thing? So there's a theorem that takes 23 steps, I think, to prove in um, uh, in Euclid, and Euclid actually, okay, the slight disappointment of the whole thing is if you look at the history, Euclid himself did not write down the proofs. Euclid just wrote, these are things that are true. Subsequent commentators added the proofs, but the proofs have been pre pretty consistent for a couple of thousand years now. Um, so, but, you know, given those, the proofs that were written down, um, there is a, there's a theorem that takes 23 steps to prove from the original axioms. What is that theorem? The theorem happens to be the fact that there are five platonic solids. Um, but it's interesting that they, I mean, from this I, I couldn't conclude very much about the kind of the meta, the empirical meta mathematics of, of Euclid, uh, but I think with, with larger collections of theorems we might be able to conclude more. Anyway, so, so one approach to kind of uh, doing pure math by computer is you create this thing, you know the axioms, you start generating theorems, you try and use heuristics to say which theorems are interesting, these are the ones you should look at, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one approach. Another thing you could do is take a much more empirical approach, a more, a more literature-based, more historical approach, and just say, let's just take all the theorems of mathematics that have been proved, and let's curate them, and let's put them in some kind of computable form, okay? So it turns out there are about three million theorems that have been proved in the history, of, that have been written down in the published literature of mathematics. There's about 100 million pages of mathematical literature, um, and uh, the, the doubling time is actually quite long. 
um, and the, I forget how many, I don't remember, I think doubling time is on the order of 20 years or something. Um, but uh, so there's a certain rate at which theorems are being proved, but there's three million theorems basically. And so the question is then, what can we do with all these three million theorems? And can we put them in a form where uh, we can uh, we can do more than just look at the text source of each theorem or something. Um, so I kind of got interested in this a couple of years ago, and we did kind of a pilot project where we took the literature about continued fractions, which is a field that has the feature that it has been studied from about the 1600s until now, and there's a sort of trickle of results about it. And we tried to curate all the theorem of continued fractions. And we got, we've probably done about a third of them. It's not very satisfactory. Say. We try to encode each theorem in a kind of symbolic form so that if there's a question that can be answered from that theorem, you can answer it from the symbolic representation of the theorem. Okay? And um, uh, what ended up happening, actually, is sort of interesting because in the process of doing that, a bunch of new math got discovered. Because math is not usually done like natural history where you're just collecting theorems. But what happened in this case was, you know, after collecting 100 theorems, uh, one of the people who was working on it noticed, gosh, you know, there's actually a, a big meta theorem that you can get, which you can see after you collect 100 theorems. And that's just not usually a way that people think about doing math, as theorems by the barrel or something. It's more, you know, it's more individual uh, uh, sort of personal attention to each theorem. So anyway, so we have this, this project that actually is, is some, uh, what happened in this project is one of the rare cases, usually I'm just a simple entrepreneur who tries to, you know, build stuff. Um, but I decided this was a project that was sort of for the math community, um, and if the math community didn't care about it, there was really no point in doing it. Um, and also it required lots of expert mathematicians um, to really make the project happen. So it sort of initiated the process of getting the world math community interested in this. But I would say that that's going rather well, and there's a whole elaborate <coughs> thing with the, the, um, uh, the International Math Union and so on, committees and all sorts of things that people like me don't understand. Um, in terms of how things get done, um, but sort of gradually working its way towards creating uh, what probably will end up being called the Math Heritage Project, which is a project to try and take the whole literature of mathematics, grind it up, and basically put all its theorems into computable form, um, and also get the bibliometrics of the literature trees and so on for math. But it's sort of an interesting project because it is the, I mean, to do it requires basically encoding all these things about, so you know, in, in our language we have an encoding for what's a polynomial, what's a graph, what's a this, what's a that. The, the <coughs> issue is to sort of take all the concepts of pure mathematics and encode them in symbolic form. And I could yak on a bit about how that, how that might work. We haven't done it yet. Um, uh, my guess is, you know, in, um, uh, in, in our language right now we have about 5,000 built-in uh, functions and about, uh, um, oh, probably, uh, 50 million entities, things like, you know, the city of New York, or, you know, carbon dioxide, or something like this. Um, so the question is, how many more do you need to cover pure math? My guess is it's about a thousand more kind of function type things, and a whole bunch of entities. So, you know, an entity is this particular kind of, this particular mathematical object or space or something, and a, a function is things like, uh, then a function space, this particular function space. That, that kind of thing. So, so anyway, it's a project that we've been sort of trying to understand how to do this project, and it's sort of a, a it will be some kind of community project, I suppose. To, uh, although in the end, it requires kind of careful design of the pieces. Um, but the, the goal of it is eventually to get to the point where, well, there, there's several things that will happen. And one of the early things that will happen is um, okay. So one of the things one has to do. We, we've been pretty successful at doing natural language understanding. But given a thing that's said in natural language, we can understand it. We also do a pretty good job of natural math understanding, in the sense that if you type in some weird thing in some funky notation, there's a pretty good chance that old math will understand it. Um, in fact, at this point, for math type things typed into old math, 98% of the time we successfully understand it, um, and uh, which I'm fairly, fairly pleased about. But so one of the things that we have to try and do is to do natural math understanding <coughs> for all math papers. And that's a complicated thing because you've got some random formula there, and it's referring to you know where g is a something or other, and squiggly x is a something or other, and that was mentioned somewhere in the paper, and you have to be able to decode enough of the paper to understand. And we've got to this particular formula, what does all this stuff mean? 
Um, and so that's another that's another problem is natural math understanding. Even the problem of math OCR has never been solved. That is the problem of going from an image like the old math papers where there's no, you know there's no text source or whatever. You know, Gauss didn't didn't use tech, um, and so you know, the only form of those things is in uh, is typically in you know in a typeset image, right? And you have to you know it's the one's pretty good now at doing OCR, optical character recognition, from regular text. That problem has never been solved for math. Um, partly, and the main reason it hasn't been solved is because the way it actually works for ordinary text is the actual OCR is pretty bad. It's pretty probabilistic. You know, is it, a, is it an A or is it an O and things like this? It's not particularly good. But what has, what has gotten pretty good is the context understanding of what are the possible words, what does the whole document mean, this is what that word must mean, it's all realistic. It's the same way that, that voice recognition is done. That's the same, it's the same reason that voice recognition has gotten good. It's because of the context understanding. But we haven't been able to do that for math, but now that we have enough math knowledge, with enough math knowledge, we can, we can apply those techniques to sort of natural math understanding. Anyway, so in the, in the future, you know, we, we've tried to, uh, uh, with Mathematica and Wolf Mathematica and so on, uh, we've, we've made some progress in, in changing sort of the way that uh, uh, people can do math. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is perhaps interesting is at some point in the future, assuming we go forward with this, this math heritage project, um, there will be a rather different way to, to proceed with doing pure math, um, making more, you know, being able to build more explicitly on kind of the, the, the corpus of knowledge that's been built up in the history of math. I mean, in general, the theme of kind of our language and so on is kind of it's a knowledge-based language, but the idea is to build on knowledge that's been sort of accumulated in the civilization and be able to do computations from that. Um, I could go on later, but I'm sure I've way over time, um, and uh, maybe I've, uh, I've covered a few different areas. I'm happy to talk in more detail or answer questions about anything to do with um, uh, computation technology, uh, business even. Um, other things that people are interested in. So, thanks very much. I think we have time for only a couple of questions. I'm happy, I'm happy to go on, but <laughs> people want to stay. Yeah, please. What kind of statistics do you take from Wolf from Alpha Theory? Like, would you be able to say that 17% of integrals they asked to solve included science squared of x? Yeah, yeah, we do. So, I mean, we keep, um, we keep everything. And, uh, and so, um, you know, you can see, I mean, one of the number one reasons why we care about that is to figure out something we can't do. The things we can do are probably less interesting to us than things we can't do. One of the issues with things we can't do is can we make clusters of different kinds of things where we can say, this is a general kind of thing that we're working on. It's kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing because we have a giant to-do list from billions of queries a day. And the question is, what is in that to-do list? And how do you make clusters? And what does the long tail look like? And is there a cluster where there's a higher probability where this is, you know, where people are asking about cars, for example. You know, there's some probability they're asking about cars. The problem is if we don't know about cars, it's hard to know if they're asking about cars. Um, and so that there's been developed some fairly interesting methods for clustering things, even though we don't know what they are, and then looking at the cluster and seeing what it's about. Um, and that sort of generates this, this giant to-do list of, of progressively decreasing, uh, you know, uh, importance and, and, and of, uh, of being able to do things. But yeah, in, in terms of, I mean, one question that I was actually curious about recently was, um, I mean, if you look at math textbooks and so on, I mean, I, I don't really know what the space of like integrals that people are asked to do in math textbooks. The one thing I do know is if you look at the textbook, you know, this chap Colin McClure and Moto, I guess the first calculus textbook, 1727, so I'm not trying to even die. Um, but if you look at that book, it has exercises, and the exercises are shockingly similar to many modern calculus book exercises. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of tells you that the space of intervals that can actually realistically be done by humans is not all that. It's not as big as we might think it would be. And which is a, another, you know, it's a big point in terms of using computers to do things. It gets a lot more realistic when you can use a computer to do an arbitrary computation rather than when you have to sit within this a sort of particular zone of, of, of doable computations. Yes? So, yeah, so you finished your PhD at Caltech at 21. So for those of us who are less uh, productive, um, you know, I'm kind of curious, like, what's your take on grad school uh, in general, and, and then just, like, the future of higher education 
So I mean, actually, I made it while I was still twenty, so I, I couldn't buy it anyway. <laughs> and I should have. It was it was kind of stupid, and I was not thinking ahead enough because it would have been really easy to get my PhD while I was still a teenager. But I didn't think at the time that boy, that would be a cool thing to be able to say subsequently. <laughs> so that's one of those things is is to think ahead, so to speak. But but more seriously, in terms of in terms of you know, I think one of the things that people sometimes don't there are certain tracks that people follow in the world, and one thing that is often shocking to me is people in graduate school and things like that, they have very little idea what happens next. Like, what do people do if you're in math graduate school, or physics graduate school, or computer science graduate school, you know, what's next, right? And, uh, you know, I think that, that it, is so, it is often very useful to think about what might be next. And people often get stuck in a certain track where they, you know, they did well at school, they're gonna go to graduate school, they're gonna do this and so on. And, you know, they don't always recognize what the best thing to do is. So, so one point that I would make is, you know, you're good at certain things, you identify things you're good at because those are things that, uh, sort of the academic world has presented you as things to do. Like you might be good at math, for example, you might like math. Um, the question is, uh, but, you know, the number of people in the world who actually do math for a living is not very large. Um, and, but nevertheless, the things that make people like math uh, are things where there are many very interesting professions that involve doing things which are the essence of why people like math, but they're not math. So, for example, you might like solving problems. You might like, you know, formal structures. You might like, you know, doing puzzles. You might like being, you know, doing intellectually competitive things or something. Uh, you know, there are a bunch of different things. And, you know, there are a bunch of different kinds of professions where those, you know, those things which are sort of the essence of what you might like about math are, you know, very much visible, but those things have nothing to do with what you see in academia. I think also, you know, people, and one of the difficult things about career planning is that, you know, you plan a career, or you start thinking about a career when you're kind of young, hopefully, but then, you know, there's many, many decades of career that get to play out. And the, you know, if you choose to become an X, then you're really, uh, you know, depending on the trajectory that that field of X follows over the next few decades, you can do well or you can do not so well. And typically, the people who invest are the people who get into a new field that is just emerging when they get into it. Because, you know, the first cohort of people who are doing something will be the people who are out ahead when, you know, as that field progresses. And today, you know, a good heuristic for figuring out a new field is, you know, add the word computational in front of basically any existing <laughs> field, and you will get a new field that, you know, I don't know, start with the A, you know, computational architecture, computational archaeology, you know, computational <laughs> whatever the field is there. You know, so, you know, taking both of those as examples, you know, like computational archaeology, okay, it's, you know, it's partly GPS, uh, uh, placement of things is partly, you know, reconstruct the, the crushed urn using, you know, fancy computational geometry, things like that. These are all things which are just starting to be possible, and whoever gets into those first, in another 25 years, those will be the, the leaders of that field. Um, now, so, you know, but, but typically, people who are in academia, they don't have a reason to know about these new emerging things, not least because the new emerging things usually aren't, you know, the thing that the Department of X works on is because the Department of X is sort of working on centrally the stuff that's in, in that field, and the stuff that tends to be really interesting is the stuff that's somehow in between an, an existing department and, a, and a, you know, two existing departments, and maybe in 30 years there'll be a department of that new thing at universities. But, um, uh, and, and, and generally with fields, like for example, this happened in, in quant stuff, you know, financial engineering and so on. Uh, back in the day, you know, maybe 30 years ago, I had all these friends who were physicists and, you know, people discovered after the Black-Scholes model came out and so on, people realized, gosh, you can use physics-type thinking to do interesting quantitative finance. And a lot of people from physics, you know, a certain number of people from physics said, that's a cool thing to do, let's go do that. And they became quants on Wall Street and those people uh, mostly did incredibly well and, you know, there are all these things in quantitative finance that are named after that first cohort of people who went into it. Then after a bit of time, you know, it became much bigger and there were lots of businesses being hired. And then there started to be, you know, uh, financial engineering programs at universities. And that's usually the beginning of the end. So 
know, that means that there's a lot of people going into that, that thing. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have a good career doing that. But the, you, know, you get the very best performance if you're in something where there isn't yet a department of that at, at a university. So then the question is, so, so a good question is, should people, I mean, in terms of, of, of uh, like, OK, so like at my company, we hire lots of, uh, uh, lots of talented people. And you might ask, what kinds of, you know, what are the backgrounds of those people? So one thing I know, we, we, we hire roughly equal numbers of people with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs. Um, and an interesting question is, what is the, you know, what is the different performance of those different types of people? Uh, some areas, there are PhDs who are, who are um, you know, some kinds of algorithm development and so on. There are very specialized things that people need to know about, and they've got a PhD doing that. And that's really good because that's what we need, and that's all. That's all, all cool. Um, in other places, um, what uh, you know, it's not so clear that the that the PhD is such a worthwhile thing, because you know, in fact, in a, a heuristic, not a not an unusual heuristic, is that people with you know who have PhDs tend to be a little narrower in the focus that they have in terms of the things they're interested in than people who just you know got a bachelor's degree but kept reading all kinds of stuff and learning all kinds of things. I mean, people, people I think, fail to understand sometimes that, that in most, in many careers, certainly in the technology industry, um, it's uh, um, the, um, you know, you have to keep learning stuff. I mean, I've been lucky enough in my life that, that I learn new stuff all the time. I mean, I, I, you know, every, you know, I'm always trying to learn new fields, new, new things about different areas and so on. Um, and it gets easier after you've learned a whole bunch of different fields because there's certain methodologies for learning things. It also gets, uh, you know, you end up being able to figure out interesting things because you can connect this thing you learned five years ago to this thing you're learning now and so on. But, you know, in general, look, I, I mean, from, a, from the point of view of, if you're asking questions like, you know, like for companies and things, what do, what makes, you know, when people have all kinds of academic credentials and so on, what makes them look good in terms of companies that are hiring them, for example? The question might, might be, might, I, I know in, you know, the thing that, um, the, the kind of killer thing is, you know, the cover letter that says, you know, uh, I have this educational background, therefore I can do this job at your company, okay? Um, it's uh, somehow, um, uh, the, the thing that is usually the most convincing is when people have done some project Okay, so you know, you do some interviewing. Um, uh, what should people get out of this? I suppose um, uh, you know, one thing that's true is you do a PhD, you've done a big project. You know, that's a that's a that's a non-trivial fact for somebody. You know, it's I mean, the more the more cynical of people in. Um, uh, I shouldn't. This is this is bad. <laughs> the more cynical, you know. In a hiring kind of, kind of thing, okay, you did a PhD. That means you can do, you know, that means you can survive through a big project, right? That's a, that's a, you know, that's one fact that you get. That nothing else is true. If you actually got a PhD, then you managed to survive and actually do a do a, a fairly big project. You know, people tend to be optimized for projects of different sizes. So, for example, there are people who, you know, you give them a problem, and in ten minutes they'll figure out something really interesting and you know be able to solve and have a great time doing that. You say, do this thing that's going to take three months. They're like, oh my god, you know, they, they're like they're bouncing on walls. Nothing really comes together, etc. <laughs> There's another set of people where you know they're used to big projects. So you say, give them a small project, and they'll say, well, first of all, I have to set up all the structure, and I have to organize it, and I have to you know figure out how to manage this project, and nothing gets done for two weeks or two months or whatever. But you know, there are people who are optimized for doing six months, one year projects, and so on. And different people, you know, there are different career tracks for people who are a different job skill of um, But that is the thing that people, you know, one thing that people learn is, you know, if you if you've ever written a big program, that is a very useful skill if you're going to work for a place that involves writing big programs. And you know, as we, for example, math students, they typically have never written large programs. And so, for example, in a company like ours. Um, there's always a, a learning curve, which takes about six months. For people to go from yes, I'm a smart math person, and um, you know, like I'm just thinking personally, I recently 
MIT PhD, who's very smart. Um, and, um, you know, she will, you know, she's doing all kinds of very good algorithm things, but it will take about six months before she can do stuff that is kind of big program development, as opposed to, so this is a specific algorithm that will have this, this type of thing. Um, and I think, uh, uh, probably way out of the moment, so. Um, uh, anyway, I, I, was, I, was, was that responsive to <laughs> <laughs> We're having the computer like um, prove uh, statements in Boolean algebra from specific um, you know axioms or from previous theorems. I was wondering, is there a process that chooses which theorems to sort of try out for um, the steps in the proofs and like which axioms or previous theorems would be most helpful, or is it just sort of trying every single one no, and seeing? No, this has become so. If you try and tree out the whole thing, it becomes Im immensely. I mean, that, that is, the main problem is to prune the tree and not try out. And there are a bunch of techniques. So that particular axiom, that particular proof, um, ended up being uh, there's in any case, I, I um, that particular proof uh, involved a hundred steps or something. You can print it in small print. Which hundred steps and which lemmas should be chosen along the way? That is the main skill is to figure it out. And there is a there are some techniques that are fairly fancy that come from some sort of algebraic methods. There's a, a whole technology called unfailing completion, um, which is a, a um, uh, it's a methodology for basically pruning the tree as you try and do theorem pruning. Um, and it's it's fairly fancy math actually that's been done to figure out how to do that. It's really something that transformed about ten years ago uh, from it being a kind of a, a let's just tree out all the possibilities and hope for the best to us use, I mean, it's connected to things like Grobner bases, and it's connected to Knuth Bendix algorithm. There's a whole cluster of things that will turn out to be equivalent um, that are what is used to prove those trees. Yes, please, last, very last thing. 